with me is uh, <laughs> with me is the police chief at SUNY, Thomas Dugan, uh, assistant chief Vincent Cardoza, senior investigator Duel Duke Navar Navaris, press officer of Cunius Ryan Neyman, um, and uh, Kevin Doherty of Doherty and Buckman's elevator expert. Mike Vecchiano, of course, the chief of the Rackets Division. Laura Neubauer is executive assistant in charge of Rackets. And Lawrence O is a bureau chief in Rackets. Joe Ponzi is the chief investigator. And of course, the, uh, this announcement has not really anything to do with the tragedy, or recent tragedy, tragedy in Manhattan, but it is by a firm hope that the irony of uh, the uh, connection in time will lead hopefully to legislation that uh, Senator Keith Wright has, uh, has offered in Albany. And a uh, special assistant to Senator Keith Wright, Maurice Cummings, is here today with us. Last Christmas Day, Ms. Deborah Jordan, 47 years old, visiting a patient at SUNY Downstate Hospital in Brooklyn. As Ms. Jordan was entering a passenger elevator on the first floor of the hospital, while its doors were still open, the elevator moved upward rapidly, trapping her left leg between the elevator and the floor landing. The elevator traveled up seven flights, and the victim suffered repeated torturous injuries as her leg struck each floor. Her screams could be heard across the hot throughout the hospital as she passed each floor, unable to free herself from this nightmare. We allege that what happened to Ms. Jordan was a direct result of the criminal conduct of the defendant, Jason Jordan, an elevator technician who had been sent to repair the elevator. Immediately after this terrifying incident, my office working with investigators from SUNY Downstate, which was led by uh, Duke Navaris and Chief Dugan, Assistant Chief Cardozo launched a complete investigation which revealed that the defendant's conduct on that day was so reckless and depraved that it constituted a crime. It is important to understand that elevator systems are sophisticated machinery run by computers and protected by multiple safety features and devices. These features ensure, among other things, that the doors will not close if something is in the way, and that the elevator will not move unless the doors are securely closed. And yet in this case, the elevator went up with Miss Jordan's leg sticking out of the unclosed doors. The direct cause, we allege, was the actions of the defendant who was there to fix the elevator and took a shortcut to diagnose the problem. He disregarded well-established industry standards by failing to take the elevator out of service before overriding the safety device designed to prevent the elevator from moving with the doors open. When the elevator finally reached the eighth floor, Ms. Jordan was lying terribly maimed on the floor of the elevator, trapped between it and the landing. A doctor heard her screams and found her in the gap between the elevator car and the eighth floor landing. Her left leg was stuck mid-thigh with a bone exposed. Her left arm was fractured so severely that bones were sticking out and she was bleeding profusely. With the help of the members of the New York City Fire Department, Ms. Jordan was freed from the elevator and was immediately treated for her injuries. She was transferred to Kings County Hospital, where she remained for three months, and afterward was released to a rehab facility where she is still being treated. What is truly disturbing is that while hospital staff and members of the New York City Fire Department hurried to save Miss Jordan. The defendant, seeing what he done, what he had done, fled the hospital without saying a word or offering help. In just a few minutes, we'll show excerpts from hospital surveillance tapes, which depict some of what occurred that day. Lawrence O will, will narrate it for you. Earlier this week, a Kings County grand jury returned an indictment charging the defendant, Jason Jordan with assault in the first degree, reckless assault, and reckless endangerment in the first degree, as well as related charges. Assault in the first degree 
is a Class B violent felony, punishable by a prison sentence of up to 25 years. Unfortunately, in this state, elevator-related injuries are not rare. And currently, New York State does not require any kind of certification, licensing, or training for elevator contractors or mechanics. Anyone can be hired to service an elevator without adequate training or experience. Maurice Cummings, the special assistant to Assemblyman Keith Wright, as I said, is with us tonight. We're sure that Assemblyman Wright's bill is going to move rapidly in Albany and, and sponsor a new bill which will put an end to this dangerous condition and will make elevator use safer for all of us. The bill requires licensing and continuing education for all elevator contractors, mechanics, and inspectors. No one will be able to install, service, repair, maintain, or inspect an elevator unless properly licensed. And every license will only be renewed with continuing training and industry courses. Continuing education is required in many fields. It certainly should be required in one where people's safety depends on the competence of the worker. I truly hope that the incident in Manhattan, the tragic incident in Manhattan, and this case will spur on the folks in Albany to pass this legislation and, and then submit it to Governor Andrew Cuomo for, uh, for signing. I'll take questions. Sir, which is more egregious, uh, this Mr. Jordan allegedly not helping the woman when she was in distress or by defeating the safety mechanism? Well, I think it's difficult to assess which is worse. I mean, the, the, uh, the law has, has a saying, the guilty flee when no one pursue it. Uh, the fact that uh, he could have uh, assisted the firefighters and the hospital staff and chose not to uh, will be part of the proof of trial. Yes. Has um, Ms. Jordan recovered? She She's in a rehab center. You know, she was three months in, in Kings County Hospital, and ever since she has remained in a rehab center. You know, thank God she's recovering, but it's a very, very long process, as you imagine. If you want, and we, we'll take other questions if you like. Oh, one more. Yes, <laughs> It's an element of foreseeability, and we believe under all of the circumstances, particularly the expert testimony that was offered in the grand jury, that we have overcome foreseeability and made out of a prima facie case, and a case that we believe uh, is substantial, and we, we believe we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Why don't we have the, uh, uh, the uh, narration? We can fill it up. We'd be happy to take some more questions. And please feel free to ask everybody. Each of these three locks are identical to the locks in the elevator system at Sweden Downstate. And for the purposes of this model, let us assume that there are three floors in this building and that the elevator travels from the first, the second, and the third floor. The light and the fan represent the motion of the elevator for the purposes of this model. This control strip is where the electrical current runs through. And this looks very much similar to the terminal strip that exists in the elevator controller at SUNY Downstate. The way an elevator safety system operates is an electrical current passes through these wires. And they have to run through every lock. And every lock must be closed, meaning that every door must be closed to an elevator before this current can then rise through, come back to the terminal strip, and then send a signal to the elevator controller, which lets the elevator controller know that every door is closed. Then and only then will the elevator actually move. If one lock or any lock is open, that current can't run through here and tell the elevator it is safe to move. Once every door is closed, the elevator then is instructed that it is safe for the elevator to operate. If any lock is open, whether damaged or whether a door is open while a passenger is entering, this elevator will not run. And this is the system that exists in every elevator. Now, let us assume that someone was entering, say, the first floor, and the lock is open, the door is open. The only way to send the electrical current to the controller, letting the elevator system know that the doors are closed, by using a wire junk device. And this is exactly what we believe Jason Jordan did on Christmas Day of last year. 
even with a door lock open, by placing the wire jumper on these two strips right here, it will bypass the safety system and allow the elevator to move. And this is exactly what we believe happened last Christmas. What I wish to show you next is at 4.38 p.m. on December 25th, in the lobby, Ms. Jordan, wearing the black coat, is about to enter the number eight elevator here. This is her daughter who's with her as she's visiting a patient. This is Ms. Jordan, this is her daughter. Who is Ms. Jordan? You'll see that as soon as she steps in, the elevator door is closed and she's only able to get her right leg in. We'll see her daughter react in horror, yes. and other medical staff respond as well. The next clip is the second floor, and you'll notice that left elevator door will bump open, and that is, as Mr. Hines said, the um, body of Deborah Jordan striking that elevator door open as her leg struck every floor on her way up to the eighth floor. Next clip is on the third floor where hospital staff hear her scream as she's being carried and ripped apart up to the eighth floor and they react in horror and uh, send themselves in motion to respond. The next clip is on the eighth floor where Ms. Jordan arrived and while hospital staff were rushing to save her life, Jason Jordan appears on the eighth floor just 15 feet away from where Ms. Jordan is trapped. She's just off the frame here, and you'll see for 13 seconds Jason Jordan stares in the direction of the victim here as hospital staff are busily trying to apply a tourniquet and to save her from bleeding to death. And instead of rushing forward and inquiring as to what happened, Instead of going back up to the elevator motor room to shut the power down, what Jason Jordan does is he turns around and flees. The next clip is of the defendant leaving the hospital lobby floor. And the next clip is him leaving the hospital altogether. 15 minutes later, fire department personnel come to go upstairs and try and extricate Deborah Jordan. The fire department spent half an hour trying to remove the body of Ms. Jordan. It was stuck in the two inch gap between the elevator car and the eighth floor landing. This is what remains of the number eight elevator on the eighth floor as the fire department used various techniques including the jaws of life to remove Ms. Jordan. Finally, what they had to do is use a gas powered saw to cut into the elevator floor to push back the 3,000 pound elevator car so that her leg could be removed. And finally, what we have here is the reconstruction. The elevator expert, in this case, went up to the control room at SUNY Downstate. And we performed a identical procedure to what the defendant did on December 25th on the number nine elevator, which is right next to the elevator that Ms. Jordan was injured in. This is the elevator expert performing the jump with a wire device, very similar to this. This is the number nine elevator with a camera inside and outside. This is the inside view of the number nine elevator, and this is the elevator motor. And you'll see that as soon as the jump device is placed, this elevator will move with its doors open, something that an elevator is never supposed to do. The final clip is a slow motion version.